Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, it's really good to see a lot of people here. And um, it's great to have uh, David Bollier, who I heard about quite a few years ago when the Radical History Group did a whole thing around commons. And I started looking into the idea of the commons and what that was. And there was, um, we about three years ago, we showed a film that David produced called, uh, was it This Land Is Our Land? Which was sort of looking at, looking at um, the commons and what that meant at that time. And it's great to have David back now. He's just produced a book, which is called Fair, Free, Fair and Alive, The Insurgent Power of the Commons, which is basically taking his thought to the, the next level. So what, what was what was initially, um, you know, the, the, idea of common, the idea of commons being around land initially very long time ago, and now talking about the commons in a much wider context than what it means. So we're really happy to have David here. He's come all the way from America. <laughs> Not today. Um, <laughs> he's, been, he's been touring around England. Um, just a couple of other things I'd like to mention were, is that the, the Cube Cinema is a volunteer-run cinema and is very much fits into the model of what a commons is in the fact that it's something which is owned by the people and it's, it's there for the community and anyone can get involved. So it was really apt, we thought, to get David here to do his talk. Well, it's, it's really kind of thrilling to be at the Cube, which, you know, I'm, I've been in uh, London and a few other places before here, and everybody, when I told them I was coming to the Cube, they said, oh, the Cube. And when I see what a true commons it is in a city with such a rich history, uh, it's really kind of a privilege to be able to present a little bit about the commons to you here. And I start with, uh, well, talking about the market and the state, because that's sort of where a lot of the conversation has to start. And I don't want to get too much into critique, but I do think we need to, of course, acknowledge that just things are falling apart. We can talk about the rise of Authorita the authoritarian right and Brexit, and we can talk about Trump, and we can talk about the failures to deal with climate change despite 30 years of documentation of the problem, the worsening of wealth inequality uh, that has occurred over the past 30, 40 years, and many other issues. We just see that neither the so-called free market nor the state are dealing with the problem. It's, it's falling apart. And there's often this false debate between, well, should it, the government deal with it or should uh, the, the market, the free market, deal with it? And I just think that's a phony debate in the sense, to the extent that both are so deeply integrated and allied around a shared vision of economic growth, so-called progress, and all that that entails, which we're mostly familiar with. But especially since the 2008 uh, financial crisis, we've seen that really the capitalist storylines are starting to fall apart. And um, I think the really both alarming and in somewhat, some ways optimistic thing is that there's a void in our political culture because there's not an alternative story for how we can reorient ourselves, start to restructure uh, things in a more uh, humane, equal, and ecologically responsible way. So tonight, well, you know, I guess tonight is inspired also by the fact that I've read one too many books of analysis, many of which were excellent and which is absolutely necessary. But then, as I was talking earlier to some people, at around chapter 11 or 12, they say, oh, here's my solutions, and it's kind of tepid, underdeveloped, not very convincing, and general. And so I like to think uh, that my book, Free, Fair, and Alive, that I wrote with my German activist colleague Silke Helfridge is kind of an attempt to write chapters 13 through 23 that <laughs> expand upon that and ex suggest in a, uh, a serious but in a uh, serious way building on many existing examples how things might unfold differently. And the basic question we want to answer is can the commons help us imagine new pathways for building a new world? And uh, in the rest of this talk, I'd like to sort of explore that, and obviously I'm going to raise more questions than can be answered, and I hope that our uh, distinguished panel and our own uh, question and answer and discussion among all of us can help address some of those questions. The, uh, 
The book just came out two weeks ago, or September 3rd, and uh, the German edition, edition came out in April, and my, my co-author Soka has been traveling in Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, and has been finding a great deal of interest there in it. And uh, just so for those of you who might be interested, Spanish and French editions are being planned for next year. So we hope to take the Commons word to some other places. Part of what we're trying to do is get beyond what I think is kind of a stale debate between well, do we want capitalism or do we want socialism? And while there's a lot to commend about socialism, uh, I think in some ways the debate, at least, is kind of an archaic debate with, filled with all sorts of historical signifiers and balances of meaning that I don't think are necessarily relevant, especially in an age of the internet when there's so much bottom-up empowerment uh, and citizen knowledge that maybe in, in capacity for uh, self-organization that wasn't uh, possible many years ago. And part of the problem is that we're, the, one reason for the void is that the market state binary has kind of eclipsed our own memories of history and culture in which the commons uh, can work. And especially here in England where there's such a, a rich and deep and long history of the commons, I think it's, uh, it's appropriate to try to recover this history. And I might just give a shout out to Guy Standing's new book, The Plunder of the Commons, which came out very recently, which is a, a, a UK specific uh, focus on the enclosures of the commons here and what might be done about it. But the problem is that the commons is not seen as a significant force for governance or provisioning or doing anything meaningful. It's kind of this archaic artifact that you know we'll look at in the history books, but it doesn't have contemporary relevance. And I think that's just false. There is a rich world beyond market and state. And one reason this has happened is because a lot of us sort of unthinkingly adopt the, this whole tragedy the commons smear, which I just want to, it's a little speed bump in this talk that we just have to get over, which is uh, Garrett Hardin was a biologist who wrote an essay in 1968 called The Tragedy of the Commons. And the basic thesis was, um, imagine you have cattle and you can put as many as you want on the shared pasture. You'll have no incentive to hold back and soon the pasture will be over grazed and exploited and just ruined, the tragedy of the commons. And this has been picked up by economists and politicians and other conservatives as a little fable for explaining why collective property, uh, collective resources cannot be managed successfully because it will result in the tragedy. So of course we need to turn it into private property or, or if we must, uh, let the government manage it. But we don't really like that. And the problem with this is that it, it contains a lot of embedded uh, political or even ideological assumptions. Uh, a friend of mine, the scholar Lewis Hyde, as it has said, it's really the tragedy of unmanaged laissez-faire common pool resources with easy access for <laughs> non-communicating self-interested individuals. <laughs> and I find this a revealing uh, explication. It just opens up what's really embedded in that whole story and shows that it, it brings all these libertarian assumptions. And to the extent that a commons, he wasn't describing a commons, he was describing a free-for-all, an open access regime where you can take whatever you want. And a commons really has uh, rules, a community, uh, a governance system, ways to punish those who violate the rules, and many other things. And in truth, he was describing what I call the tragedy of the market, where you can just freely externalize stuff or take what you want and to hell with everyone else. So uh, it's taken a long time to come to terms with this uh, fiction. But one person who had a lot to do with it was Eleanor Ostrom, a professor at Indiana University, who spent her career uh, basically going to countless uh, rural commons in the global south and elsewhere, farmlands, fisheries, forests, wild game, and examining how people successfully, as communities, whether indigenous communities or traditional communities, manage these resources. And she not only did empirical work, work, which most economists don't do, she did creative theorizing to understand how commons functioned and devised eight somewhat famous principles that distilled the essence of her research. Notably, she won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009, the first woman to win that prize. And uh, I think it's significant at least for two reasons. One, 
It was the year after the financial crisis, and I think the Nobel Prize Committee wanted someone a little bit different uh, than the standard economist, and she was known for showing how cooperation can actually be economically consequential, something that your standard econ economist doesn't really uh, care to explore. And second, I think as a woman, she was more mindful of relationships having significance in economic activity as opposed to the standard homo economicus, uh, I've got money, you give me what you have uh, approach. So uh, she helped lay the groundwork for opening up a space for talking seriously about the commons in a contemporary way, uh, despite standard economics and politics just uh, not wanting to go there. And it's important to realize that a commons is not just a resource. People often say, oh, well, the seas or the, the uh, outer space or the internet is a commons. Well, it's something that we might have an ethical or moral uh, entitlement as the human species to consider a commons, but really a commons is a living social system for managing or governing those resources. Uh, so there's a little bit, the economists are sort of superimposing uh, a certain assumptions and ascribing it to the resources when in fact the commons is a social system. And this is very important as you'll see in the rest of my talk. Now I want to take a brief detour to introduce the idea of enclosures, which many of you may be familiar with, because this is, I think, one reason why commons are coming to the fore these days. Um, enclosures, driven by capital, corporations, markets, and um, collusive state states, are privatizing and marketizing resources that belong to all of us. And the essential reason is that global capital uh, wants free and discounted access. Oops free and discounted access to more wealth, forests, fisheries, deep seas, uh, nanomatter, many other things. And they also don't want any resistance from the people who depend upon those commons for their survival. And so they often enlist the help of government and its police powers to evict the commoners from their, their land or from being able to control those resources. And these uh, enclosures are not just a conversion of a shared wealth into private wealth. It's also a, a radical dispossession of people whose identities and culture often uh, are oriented around these resources that are taken from them. And we're seeing this right now. You might say, uh, uh, oops, you might say a replay of the uh, English enclosure movement in Africa, Latin America, Asia, where you have sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds, uh, and then co governments who are working with them to evict indigenous peoples from their land, traditional communities, and uh, basically often turn them into speculative investments, uh, pushing the people into the big cities without livelihoods. And this tragedy is happening right now. 20% uh, of the human genome is now privately owned under patents, which is a factor that inhibits people, scientists, from exploring uh, the nature of the genome and pre preventing diseases. And I, I don't want to dwell on co enclosures, even though I think they're probably the greatest unacknowledged scandal of our time. But I just want to reference them because I think this is the context for understanding a lot of commons, that our, our shared wealth is being taken from us. So this was the chief subject of the film that uh, Mike was referring to, that the, the, this, this land is our land in which Sky Standing's book is all about as well. So it's just important to realize the scope of the enclosure movement. But this raises for me the question of, well, how does this mindset persist and why does it continue uh, to expand? And I want to just enter into the world of worldviews and mindsets because this is really what allows this great crime against humanity to persist. In the course of researching our book, we uh, came across the story of uh, a, a geologist, a prominent geologist in the 1840s who found these tracks in the rocks in western Massachusetts where I live. I, live, I come from Amherst, Massachusetts. And they puzzled over what created these footprints. And this was, of course, before Charles Darwin had written his book. It was before the word dinosaur had even been invented or many major fossils discovered. And he thought they were great turkey birds, uh, 
in what he, the problem basically was he was stuck in a worldview of biblical stories and creation, and that was his uh, controlling mindset, and he couldn't grasp the idea of deep time or natural selection and evolution and, and so forth. And I'd like to suggest that we're in a similar moment where the archaic viewpoint is really market capitalism, which says that value is basically the same as price, that progress is made through commodification and marketization and enclosures, and free trade, which in the service of the same things, is in fact about extraction and dispossession. But uh, people locked in this worldview of GDP, increasing GDP and growth cannot see the profound limitations of that mindset. So I'd like to propose that the commons be regarded as somewhat something of a <coughs> counterpoint for redefining some of these very ideas such as value and progress. <coughs> and the commons is in fact, or I should say commoning, the social practices and cultures and traditions that we bring to managing our shared resources, a verb, not a noun, is generative and value creating. It may not be a value that uh, has a quantitative number, a price, or cash behind it, but there's a whole array of values that are uh, personal, cultural, uh, intergenerational, uh, and sense of well-being that aren't captured in cash, as we all know. And so the Commons proposes, a, I think, a different world view and different logic and ethos than that of the market state, which is why I think this is really a different kind of um, point of engagement with many of the political struggles we have. It really goes to a deeper level than just trade policy or many other important policies. And having said that, I don't wish to propose the commons as an ideology because I think it's seriously about bottom-up practical experimentation. It's what works. It, I'm very, I feel very much in sync with people like transition movement that are very much into uh, finding, I don't want to say post-ideological because there are certain philosophical definitions, but it's about what works as an alternative. And again, this is about doing uh, as opposed to just uh, advocating or talking uh, rhetoric. And I think it even goes further in the sense that it's about learning to see relationality as a primary aspect of reality itself. Um, it's not just the kind of individualism that, that especially in uh, market-based industrial cultures, we've come to see as normative. And it's about seeing this value as a living phenomena, not something that's just on a, uh, on a balance sheet. So I, in the course of, uh, of thinking and writing this book with my co-author Silka, we came to realize that we need to shed a lot of words and concepts that were you know, familiar and used all the time, but were half wrong. Such ideas as the word resource. I choke on the word resource now because there are many things that uh, a resource implies a piece of property that can be just be sold, bought and sold, as opposed to something that we care about, that we have a, a, a deep uh, affinity for or cultural connection to, and development. Same word, same way, it's, it's seen as market growth, uh, even though, of course, it's often quite destructive and antisocial. Uh, you can see some other words that ha I have problems with, or I see that they don't quite work in the world that I'm starting to see in the commons. And at the same time, we, I found there were all sorts of words we needed to invent to describe aspects of the commons that are not really represented. Uh, instead of resources, I prefer the word care wealth for many things. And it's a different category of thought. And instead of the individual, as if an individual can exist in isolation from nature or other people or previous generations, we're all really kind of nested eyes, nested in larger communities. And instead of the rationality of economics, which says it's rational to not care about your fellow human beings, and to ignore the earth or to treat it as this brute resource. I like to talk about Ubuntu rationality, which is a Bantu term for I am because we are. There's a certain organic wholeness that we need to talk about. So it's these kinds of things that we are 
Silk and I experimented with to try to convey that there's some other concepts that the commons entails at a very deeper level that we need to start thinking about. There's not just one world in the world, there's the pluriverse, there's many ways of being. Um, and we talk about relationalized property, that instead of property just being a matter of exclusion of others, there can be social dimensions involved in it, so that it's a shared resource. You might say like the cube itself, which really belongs to the people of Bristol. <coughs> So I, I, I want another thing I want to get across is that the commons uh, is not just sort of something we talk about. It flows through us, and it's in our inner being. And I've struggled with how to convey a little bit of what that might mean. This is how the Great Sandy Desert looks to most of us moderns, or how it's historically represented. But this is how the indigenous people uh, see the same territory as a map. And you can see it's just rich, like work of art. And I like to think that many people in their commons by having connections with each other and long histories and cherished or even sacred uh, dimensions to it have this richer inner life uh, that is sometimes represented like that. And I, I think that really at bottom, uh, even though the traditional literature on the commons doesn't go, go here, that the commons is about world making in its deepest sense, not just from uh, exotic people who might have indigenous traditions, but open source communities, or the Wikipedia world, or many other modern worlds are about world making. And it, what distinguishes it from a lot of previous mm, politics, I think, is it's cultural before it's political. And it's, it's, it helps generate a politics of belonging, an economics of sufficiency, and a culture that decommodifies and mutualizes things at its heart, as opposed to reflexively turning to market uh, solutions, so-called. Now, I'm, this, this slides are a bit of a mashup with my colleague who used some of these slides to shift into what we call the need for an onto shift. <laughs> we came to realize that at this deeper level of reality, we need to start to pay attention to some of those dynamics, and while I pause at using the term ontology, we found we couldn't escape that because that lies at the heart of understanding the commons as we observed it in scores of instances. And the onto shift is really about even at the smallest level, a small group of people can embody a different perspective in how they treat each other, how they view the world. And while that might be dismissed by contemporary politics as not so important, I think onto seeds, if I can use that, that creative term, have a tendency to not just go at the micro level, but to grow organically <coughs> into meso levels of infrastructure that commoners create. You could say open source software, or open design and manufacturing communities, or platform cooperatives, or the next generation of wikis, the federated wiki, to take on a larger presence that enables those seeds to grow, or even in rare, rare for now, instances to the macro level where we can organically create new types of institutions, including, as I'll get to in a moment, talking about the state uh, being, becoming partners and growing new types of commons public partnerships instead of public-private partnerships that are essentially uh, plundering the public treasury or resources. We can have partnerships between governments and I'd like to think probably more with municipal governments than the higher levels, between governments and citizen-initiated projects that can collaborate in good faith productively. And there are a number of instances of this, as I'll talk about. So how do we understand comedy from this perspective? I'd like to explain the methodology for how um, Soka and I came to develop a new framework for understanding commons. We drew upon the work of Christopher Alexander, who some of you may know as a sort of a renegade uh, architect, mathematician, and philosopher who developed the idea of pattern languages. And he had seen, he had asked himself, why do so many designs of architecture or urban spaces recur across cultures and history and persist? It's like some strange manifestation of something uh, consistent. And he 
thinks that because, well, there's a, he has a complex set of books, especially the book, The Nature of Order, which gives it a spiritual dimension almost, although he doesn't use that term. He says it's the quality without a name, but it speaks to certain inner needs and satisfactions that people have, and that's why certain patterns <clears throat> recur. And um, what's interesting is he saw that there were certain recurrent problems that had certain patterned responses. No, no one of those responses uh, or patterns were identical, but there were, they were a sort of cluster in solving problems. And it's partly because in each instance, the patterns took account of the very particular context that it was solving for. And so naturally, it would vary. And why we, we found this compelling because it allowed us to develop, um, to talk about certain regularities and generalizations without saying they're universal and fixed because they could evolve and take, but they could also take account of particular context because every commons is unique because it takes account of its context of geography or culture or history and other things peculiar to it, as the cube, I'm sure, has a very rich history. And it's under, important to understand that a pattern is not a model or a recipe or a blueprint. It's something that is kind of <coughs> dynamic and changing itself. And the patterns that we identified for commons I think are really a, a first cut for a longer process of debate and discussion. But, and that's part of their beauty, is we can evolve them. They're not universal principles the way economics might assert. And to organize the patterns that, that we developed for the commons, we found three general areas where they, they can, they're evident. One is in peer governance, the way people self-organize themselves to be, have stable, sustaining systems of their community. Another is the social life in which people, how people can behave ethically, responsibly, and as rich, full human beings with each other. And the third was provisioning, which is how they make stuff to meet needs. So in some ways, between the three areas, we have uh, a, an integration a reintegration of the, the social or the social, the uh, economic, and the political, which is, I think, part of the beauty and effectiveness of the commons because it reintegrates all of these in a, in a uh, single system and the kind of gamesmanship that occurs in the modern uh, liberal state or market state capitalism. Uh, you can avoid some of those pathologies. So we have what we call the triad of commoning, and then a series of patterns, which I'm not, we obviously don't have time to go into all of them, but patterns for each one. It's not as if every commons has all of these patterns, but they're sort of short, succinct distillations of recurrent uh, solutions that we found in successful commons. So I'll just introduce a few of them just to go through, just to give you a sense of them. So for example, in provisioning, uh, making stuff within a commons, and I might add this is not resource focused, it's more focused on the, uh, the social dynamics of a group. Uh, and so you can see it in natural resource commons as well as digital commons or many other types of commons. We find that there's an effort to support care and de decommodified work. There's an effort to share the risks of provisioning so that it's not just uh, some capital holder or uh, corporate entity that, that is taking all the risks. And there's a tendency to rely upon distributed structures. Um, well, I won't get into all of these, but you can see we tried to mention, to try to develop um, a critique that just as economics has homo economicus, which has a whole story of how human beings supposedly interact to create value, we think that these are the kinds of things that have a similar role in commons. And peer governance, which we, we drew a lot on the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who speaks quite a bit about governance, we identified some of these factors, such as relying on heterarchy, which is kind of a more uh, flattened version of hierarchy, where people can more accessibly uh, participate in the organization, and relationalized property, which I alluded to, where there's a social element and control of the resource or care wealth than uh, 
simply the exclusive rights of, of an owner that we traditionally see. And there's a tendency to share knowledge generously, which we see in oh, lots of digital spaces, as opposed to artificially creating an envelope of property rights around it and created a, creating a market uh, product or something to sell, as we see in you know, publishing or academic, the academic uh, publishing world. And then finally, just to show you some of the patterns in social life, there's a, a tendency, an accent on cr contributing freely, and people tend to have ways to ritualize their togetherness to show that they're, you know, they're, they have a shared purpose. Well, cultivating shared purpose and values is connected to ritualized togetherness. And, and actually, that's another point. None of these patterns can be looked at in isolation. They're kind of a constellation of interconnected ways of being in the commons. And our, our point in developing this was to get sort of um, both a new lens into understanding commons, but also some practical how-to guidance for people to check on how they might do, make their own commons. And as I said, these are not automatic blueprints. You have to enact them and adapt to your own circumstances for them to be real and functional but they are a way to understand certain regularities of the commons. Um, I'll mention a few others and then I'll just have a few concluding slides and then we can talk some more about all this. Practice gentle reciprocity. It's a nice counterpoint to the quid pro quo that we see in markets where I give you this only if you give me that. In a commons, social solidarity is created by giving and not immediately getting back. It might be indirect, it might come in the future, but it's, it's precisely that there's this uh, social connection that's at least as important as the getting back. Although there are both uh, uh, obligations and entitlements linked in a commons. Uh, contribute and share. We use the word contribute and share in tandem with another form because you can share knowledge by sharing it. You don't uh, lose any value, you, you can enhance value by sharing it, but for certain resources like water or land or other things which are fi supposedly finite or often are finite, you need to pool, cap, and divide up. And that's a different dynamic than sharing, which is I think an, over, an overly generic term for how things should happen, and we've seen in fact how the market world says we have a sharing economy, which is really just a micro-rental economy. So we wanted to give a little more precision for what's going on in a commons so that people can behave accordingly if they want to build a commons. And an important aspect of all this is reflecting on their peer governance. Is this working well for us? You need to actively talk about that and not just assume it's going to happen. And a lot of all these patterns add up to another principle that we found, which is keeping the commons and commerce distinct. It's not as if a commons cannot interact with markets or, you know, we're in a capitalist economy. It's hard to escape it. But it is important that whatever interactions with the economy uh, do not come to colonize and take over the stable inner dynamics of common in itself. So this, too, is another important pattern. Okay, I just have a few more slides to conclude this. Um, People often say, well, how do we scale the commons? After all, it tends to be with smaller entities, and uh, you know, how can we um, get it bigger? I have an aversion to the word scale because it tends to be associated with centralized hierarchical institutions, and that often works to the detriment of the commons because a commons is precisely about an appropriate scale where there can be responsibility and stewardship. So I. But I, nonetheless, I think that the commons have an enormous capacity for being expanded and being more influential. A lot of it comes down to what we call emulating and federating, which means you don't copy, but you emulate in your circumstances other commons. And then you can federate despite, um, especially in the internet age, you can federate to co-learn, provide mutual support, and develop a sector much as you might say uh, the open source software world, creative commons, open access publishing, wikis, and many other of those spaces have become loosely federated um, digital communities that mutually support each other. 
it's also important in terms of expanding commons to develop infrastructures that can help commoning work more easily. Uh, they're enabling structures like in the Catalonia region of Spain, there is a Wi-Fi net, a major Wi-Fi system that's a commons-based system that enables people to have uh, cheaper, high-quality internet access without using the usual uh, predatory telecom world. So infrastructures by having the scale and the uh, assistance to would-be commoners can help expand things as well. And as I mentioned, there's the potential for commons public partnerships where governments can enter into arrangements by providing legal authority, technical support, financial support, or other means for, uh, instead of having a command and control state bureaucracy, especially at city levels, you can work with citizens in a more collaborative way. I just learned the other day that in Preston, there's uh, efforts to develop such partnerships, which I find a really intriguing and positive development. So in concluding, um, I think the pattern for growing the scale of the commons will be, the next big thing will be a lot of small things. And the challenge will be how to horizontally connect these, how to build the infrastructures, how to find the interstices within state power by which uh, we can grow the commons. These are all, I might add, difficult challenges, both in a technical and sometimes political way. But I think uh, much of the infrastructure of capitalism reflects precisely these social norms and habits that have accrued over time. And there's no reason state power can't be uh, helpful in developing this system. Um, and one reassuring idea for me in this is Hannah Arendt's quote that power springs up between people when they act together and vanish the moment they disperse, which suggests that really the commons by creating a semi-sovereign group of people with a vision and commitment as a cultural factor becomes implicitly political, especially as it grows and bumps up against existing state laws. Uh, you've made, some of you may have heard of the Falkirk uh, Charter and other community charters or commons charters that have been established, which I think are a way to assert this kind of power against the presumption that the market state uh, should simply dictate the terms of, for how we live. So the commons becomes a staging area and a way to grow a different vision. So these are kind of the themes we've explored in our book. We found that we raised many more questions than we could answer uh, because of the range of issues and let's just say the frank ambition that we had. At the same time, I think it's a time for bolder, uh, deeper explorations of what we want from cult culture and politics. And we wanted to start a new conversation about some of these issues. So I'm thrilled to be able to share that with this community here. And I'd love to hear from the respondents. And let's just have a conversation. So thank you all. Um, but we've now got a, a panel discussion. Um, so what we're going to do is get everyone to sit up on the keys on <laughs> Uh, and if I get you to introduce yourselves in a minute, I just wanted to uh, ask you a question, David, because yes. it's, it's quite theoretical what, you're, what you put across there. And I just wondered if you could sort of explain a little bit what it might feel like or look like in a, in a community if, if, if we had these things in place. Well, I would just say that many of these things, while it might sound theoretical, uh, commenting is going on all over the world. Um, an estimated 2 billion people in the world live in traditional commons and meet their needs through traditional natural resource commons. And around this city and many others, it, the words, the terms are not necessarily used. And I don't even really care if they're used necessarily, except the commons can be a, a cultural connective tissue for explaining them. But the point is, I think the commons is the natural human condition. Uh, for how we get things done. And the past 200 years is kind of an aberration in thinking that we could be isolated individuals. So what does it look like in a community? 
it looks like an ecosystem where you have community land trusts and alternative currencies and uh, community-owned theaters and radio stations. And you, you, once you start to see these uh, different phenomena, you see that they constitute kind of an interlocking sector that has a, a great potential for reimagining the kind of society want, we want to have. So I think it's going to vary from one community to the other. Some have richer resources or traditions to draw on. Uh, but uh, in some ways, it's being able to identify the common in, in our midst that isn't necessarily recognized and therefore not validated properly. So that, I, that's my response, but we can talk about it further. Great. So what I'm going to do, just before we come to questions in the audience, is just to let everyone introduce themselves and then, and then get a response on what they said and then we'll open it up to questions. So as we start with... Sure. How long do we have to respond? Just so I don't. Um, not to ages, so you can get some questions. <laughs> Give me a precise amount. I'll do yeah. Um, yeah. I'm Susan Newman. I'm an associate professor of economics at the University of the West of England, but I'm also uh, an anti-war and anti-austerity activist, and I've had a, spent most of my adult life as an anti-capitalist activist as well. Um, am I carrying on? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, he started. Uh, thank you. So. Um, David, I mean, I find that I agree in where you want to go, right? And I absolutely think that we do need to have a, something different from capitalism. And I also agree that the 200 years that we've had so far, uh, you know, the last 200 years have been an aberration in human history. Although prior to that, it hasn't all been rosy either, right? But, you know, having some, you know, but that aberration is capitalism. And, and capitalism itself, and I think a lot of the debates you're talking about now I mean, of course, in a different context, but Marx was having them. Marx had discussions and debates and critiques of utopian socialist ideas very much related to this. Whilst I think Marx was extremely uh, sympathetic in the way I am about experiments and ways in which we can live in a different way, he brought in something, I think, that was really important. And in a way, I was reading this, I think this is almost like Marx without Marx. Because what's missing here is the class structure in society and what happened, what capitalism really is at its core. So in arguing against a dichotomy, market versus commons or market versus state, you're re you know, sorry, market versus state or things like that, you're reintroducing dichotomies that actually don't get to the crux of the matter. And I think that's what we need to go back to. And I think you use a lot of the same terminology as people like David Harvey use around enclosures and primitive accumulation. But I think, I think you need to connect that enclosure process to profit, capitalist society, class structures, and the state not only as some things separate from people, but uh, coming out, the governance structures coming out on the ways in which society is organized in the production of things, mm -hmm. either for profit or in a much more wonderful sharing way that you know, uh, relates to human needs. So that's what I wanted to say. And also to say there are many ways in which people have studied this process from nature to the, and I think one of the places you met, uh, missed out in enclosures there is women's bodies and the way in which women's bodies have been enclosed and uh, dispossessed for accumulation. So I think the, what's missing here is class, accumulation, and, uh, and an understanding of, of, of the things that you're critiquing as not being social relations, as being social relations, but in the service of capital. Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> do, you, do you want to respond? Or, or well, do I don't. Do you want me to? I can respond now, or we can go through everybody. I don't Let's go through everyone. I think. Yeah. Okay. I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've <always got> the <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm Steve Hunt. So I'm involved with the Bristol Radical History Group. Um, I suppose I was thinking along similar lines in terms of it, it probably needs some clarification in terms of what the relationship is with capitalism. Um, so I think probably over the last few years. Um, to be anti-capitalism anti -capitalist is a little bit more acceptable than it probably was. Now, I'm thinking here um, around some of the anniversaries of 1968. So in 2008, um, there were debates going on in Bristol and people were saying globalisation is a terrible thing, capitalism is a terrible thing, but it's lifted people out of poverty um, and uh, there doesn't seem to be an alternative. I think now people are saying actually it really hasn't lifted people out of poverty and some of those um, positives were actually around measuring different things, you're, ma you're, measuring, you're not measuring, so pe people may have been living in subsistence economy, therefore if they were living on a very low wage, uh, le a low level of money every month, it didn't actually mean that they had a appalling um, lifestyles and conditions of, of lifestyle and um, 
So, so, and also the fact that actually that, that lifting out of poverty might be, um, is around extractive wealth and accumulation, which is completely ecologically unsustainable, is probably a lot of us are seeing now. So I suppose it's not quite clear to me, or maybe it needs clarifying a little bit more, about whether um, the, the commonings imaginary is something that sits within whether, whether it's seen as a kind of a, a social democratic model where you've got the state and you've got capital and then you've got a third party at the table, um, which is commoning, uh, or whether it's a, a, a pathway away from capitalism and, 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 and where that's going. And um, I'll, I'll shut up as well in a minute. But I was also interested, Mike mentioned what does a commons look like? Um, and I was quite struck by your point, David, that it's... It's something that works. And an example for me would be looking at, thinking about the late 60s, early counterculture. And in Bath at, the, um, it, at that time, from the early 70s onward, there was a thing called Bath Arts Workshop. And that was an amazing example of a commons, if you think about it, um, because it brought together some of these organizations or entities or commons entities, which are still in existence, but there was, um, there was a, 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 the Natural Theatre Company, there were free festivals, there, was, um, there were various venues involved, there was a whole cultural network, but people were producing food. Um, probably one of the most interesting things was a thing called Comtech, which, which started in the mid-1970s in Bath. And that was a national event where people would get together and they would create, uh, they would share ideas around radical technology and there is a school of thought that actually the, uh, when we talk about uh, renewable technology and wind power and uh, solar power, actually a lot of that innovation came from Comtech. There were, there were in other um, initiatives um, across the Atlantic and, and elsewhere in Scandinavia, but that, that there were some really important innovations there. So you've got this whole, it's quite difficult almost to describe what that network was, but there were lots of different initiatives all working together and really effectively. They, they put on um, big Christmas lunches and uh, they put on um, coach trips for older people. So there was this big kind of social di dimension going on. Um, but it's not really there anymore because one of the problems is when something's successful, then capitalism will co-opt it and will take it over. And I think we've probably seen that in Bristol as well, haven't we? There's, a, there's this almost this kind of Bristolians of all almost create this lovely Bristolness. <laughs> and then the things that make Bristolness um, suddenly becomes a really valued thing. People want to live here. And actually some of these common spaces are, are disappearing. So lo the lovely cube is still here, but um, Stokes Croft as a whole probably looks similar, but I would say it's probably less commons than it would have been five or ten years ago. So just, just some thoughts. Hi everyone. Um, my name's Phil Pope. I'm chair of Bristol Labour Party. Um, I'm also a member of the Cooperative Party, which is part of the Labour Party, so I'm, I have an interest in this. Um, and before I was seduced by Jeremy Corbyn, I was uh, involved in anarchist projects for about 15 years or so. So I've seen some small-scale ideas about, about this, this area. Um, now, everyone knows about the, the, the common lands in Britain centuries ago that were enclosed. Um, but into the Industrial Revolution, um, but before the welfare state, there was a period when the cooperative movement was very strong in this country. Um, <laughs> In the 1920s, maybe a third of food was distributed through cooperative shops in the cities. Um, there wasn't any welfare state then, there wasn't any NHS. Um, and outside the charity sector, there was quite a large uh, like mutual sector where people had health insurance through their unions and um, cooperative societies. Um, the late uh, anarchist writer Colin Ward wrote very extensively on how that tradition was lost um, leading up to the Second World War and, and with the Labour government immediately afterwards. Most of that culture was incorpor incorporated into the new state provision. Um, and it's been like that for the last few decades. Um, but there are signs in the Labour Party that this thinking's coming back. John McDonnell's led a lot of work on this area. Um, 
Preston was mentioned where the Labour Council there is um, really leading the way on this and um, giving council contracts preferentially to cooperative businesses and local businesses and trying to build up a like local economy of like-minded people and it's having some su some success um, a similar thing was tried 20 odd years ago in Walsall they the council there tried to radically decentralize what they were doing and hand power back to much smaller local communities um, I don't think the time was right 20 years ago and, and they, that didn't really take off in Walsall but it was uh, very bold and an idea is kind of ahead of its time. Um, and of course, we have the like cooperative, um, the cooperative uh, food shops these days, and cooperative funeral funeral care. But it's very much, uh, very much smaller scale than it was decades ago, and um, not really with the same participation of the workforce. Um, and another thing Labour's doing is looking at regional investment banks and um, trying to change the way finance is raised. Um, now, thinking back to my own experience in various little projects in Bristol, the thing that worries me is that um, too often what we're doing seems to come to rely on a small number of people working for free or for minimum wage and really like wearing themselves wearing themselves out to maintain the commons now whether that's a problem with not more people meeting their obligation to help do it together or whether it's i mean whether we do have to think about is the problem in with capitalism the ownership or the market and perhaps commons can work within a market where some people do make money and that's used to help maintain the common resource. And I think there's a question there about whether we see the market as the problem or, cl or class and ownership as the problem. Um, and I really think if we want to move on from capitalism, we want to we want an economic, economic system that is more efficient than capitalism. Um, of course, there's a problem of externalities. So many capitalist businesses damage the environment. And I don't think people who are minded to get into common enterprise would be minded to do the, the same thing there. But n notwithstanding that, we, I think if, this is gonna, if the commons is really going to become massive, it's got to be... Um, it's got to be an economic system that can be efficient and for that I think you need something at least like money to keep track of what's being produced, how well it was produced, how it's been consumed. Because to have any sort of complex society you've got to keep track of what's happened so it can be analysed and you can think about how to do it better. Whether that's money or whether we, it's some, we call it something different, I don't know. But I'd, I'd like to know other people's thoughts on how that, that sort of idea could work. Thanks. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Melissa Henry. I'm uh, uh, representing here um, Anthropocene Actions, which is a community interest company based in here in Bristol. Um, our raison d'etre is to um, create fair, loving and ecologically regenerative societies just a small ambition. Um, and I think that the way we want to do that is by coalescing people with shared values. And I think what you've been saying, David, really resonates with quite a lot of what we've been thinking about. Because we would, I think, agree that actually people, we are hardwired to cooperate and to collaborate and to work together. And we've been quite influenced by the work of the uh, Common Cause Foundation, which has done quite a lot of research um, around people's values. Um, values, you can dance around the values map all you like. We all have a set of values. Um, and depending on the environment within which we live or work or the people that we're engaging with, our values come and go. And um, when you do research across the UK with the UK population, 
Um, about three quarters of us in the UK prioritise our community, we prioritise our families, we pri prioritise universalism, benevolence, um, the intrinsic values. And um, the same survey reveals that more than three quarters of us believe that other people prioritise money, our cars, our jobs. And so you've got this perception gap whereby we feel constrained from acting on our values because we don't believe other people share our values. And I think that that's really quite interesting um, because, uh, interesting you were talking about the cooperative movement, we also did quite a detailed survey of Mancunians and in Greater Manchester the tendency to prioritise community and family, the, the, the intrinsic values, was slightly higher than the UK national average. It was about 85%. Um, and we did that survey four weeks before the Manchester Arena bombings. We never released the results because it seemed totally inappropriate to be talking about um, that at a, such an appalling time. But we were totally unsurprised, as I'm sure were all of you, by the outpouring of compassion and love for each other and the, you know, the cab drivers lining up to give lifts. Um, and, you know, Manchester, home of the cooperative movement, home of um, all sorts of kind of very um, intrinsically valued movements. So it was no surprise. But I think that, yeah, so that there, that the question for me is, how do we unleash that? You talked a bit, David, about the geologist who was so constrained by his way of thinking that he thought they had giant turkeys. Why did Charles Darwin think differently? What changed? Who are those? Where is our Charles Darwin? Where are the people that are going to allow us to frame this completely differently? Um, and just one other thought, language, I think, is really, really important here. Um, and I know you're a bit of a George Lakoff kind of fan, but, you know, we really need to think about how we frame um, the commons for a 21st century audience. Um, so, yeah, that's what I've got to say. Okay. If you have some quick responses, then I'll open it up to questions. Okay. Yeah. I've just taken a few notes so I can remember all these, some of these points. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I agree that we don't mention or dwell on the class dimensions of things, but let me just say, I don't think Silk and I would disagree with much of that analysis, but we don't emphasize it either because we're trying to develop, I think, uh, a different language that's not keyed in directly to political economy, but more to uh, human behaviors that are almost anthropological in preceding it. And I think there will, and there will be engagements with political economy, there already are, as commons grow in scale. We see this especially with indigenous peoples and trade policy, for example. Uh, but I think that the language of the commons gives us a vocabulary with some philosophical grounding for beginning to confront some of these things, uh, capitalist policies, on a different basis. So I think a different heuristic without attempting to be exclusive or imperialistic or substituting for a lot of other analysis. I think there's a number of different ways to approach these phenomena. And I would add that uh, you're right, quite right to raise uh, about the feminist analysis of of this. Uh, Sylvia Federici has written some fantastic books on this topic. We do, and I think the whole issue of care work uh, as part of the economy needs more attention. And I think, again, the commons can help bring some of these things to the fore without uh, necessarily being state or policy driven about it, even though, of course, I think those things are important. Um, <coughs> let's see. Yes, the co co-optation by capital or enclosure is a constant threat, which is one reason, at least in devising our patterns of successful commons, we wanted to pay particular attention on what helps resist that, sort of preemptively building the DNA of a commons to take account of those inevitable attempts to seize and appropriate and dispossess people of commons. Can't be entirely successful because there is such thing as coercive state power that we want to deal with quite realistically, that said, uh, we found, think there's value in asserting a certain moral sovereignty that precedes the state uh, in getting out of the so-called Hobbesian contract. Um, 
you're quite right to raise the issue of this, these other traditions like the mutual sector uh, that unions uh, were the stewards of in the cooperative movement. And I think that those need to be revived uh, and not simply become seen as market, provision, market production or market uh, uh, oriented, but as ways of forms of social solidarity, which I think is really the essence of their hardiness as alternatives. Um, the issue of shared values, absolutely, this is what the Commons is about, but I would just add it's about uh, actual practices which help us learn and become and grow into this larger identity and give it a persistence. So uh, I think that there's this dynamic sense of learning to be, act, think, feel like a commoner as opposed to a series of policies that we can let politicians or regulators enact because it ultimately on the ground this regeneration is going to depend upon us doing some, a little work, taking some responsibility and learning to be commoners. And indeed finding ways for our intrinsic values to have some enduring institutional support. So that's not just me making a personal change but us finding a way to make a change and uh, have it be sustained by each other and, I don't know, the Cube Theater, the way it helps give us a different, a different uh, way of um, sustaining ourselves with a different identity. So those are some of my thoughts. So, questions? <coughs> yeah. I have a, a friend, a, a nice old lady, who came back from uh, occupying Westminster Bridge. Uh, a few weeks ago, and she was uh, she was a glow. Uh, she she was alive in a way that I hadn't seen her for a long time, and she said that she'd had the most extraordinary experience uh, of working with people, and that it had taken her quite a few days to get over the sense of bereavement at, at having to come away from that feeling. Now, uh, they had uh, occupied a bridge, which wasn't their space. Um, they'd organised it themselves. They'd organised their own provisioning. Uh, they'd organised their own discipline. Uh, were they commoning? I think it reminds me of, uh, some of you may have read oh, Hakim. He wrote Temporary Autonomous Zones. Backing, back back thank you. Uh, and I think that they were creating a pop-up commons, you might say. I just thought of the term. But uh, it was a pop-up commons and that they were asserting that solidarity for that circumstance. Uh, the, the challenge, of course, is making these things persist. Uh, but I think the feelings they experienced are entirely mm, similar to the way other commoners feel, albeit perhaps not just the highs. There are challenges and responsibilities too in any commons. So and conflict. So I don't mean to say that a commons is a magic pixie dust that solves problems. There's a lot of difficulties in building the social relationships that can work. But that feeling of satisfaction and possibility is entirely uh, part of the process. Would anyone else like to quickly respond? Just be quick. I'll be really quick. Yeah. Because I realised I was talking about capitalism, but really what I wanted to talk about was labour and agency and who are the agents of change. And you do need to know about class in order to understand where that lies. Because capitalist society is based, it's not market or non-market, because I think what you argue against in socialism is often state capitalism. It's organisation production, the production of something extra that comes from exploitation of labour. So, and it's not surprising that the agents of change are those workers that understand and have that consciousness. For example, why, was Man why does Manchester have this solidarity? Well, it's, I don't think it's an accident that Manchester was also the site of the most intense industrial revolution right at its beginnings, where Engels worked, where many of these movements developed and uh, alternatives were created. So I really much understand, you know, you can't, again, commenting is something that is bottom up, but it, it's not enough because not everyone is able to feel like they can common. And once, it's only once you've removed a lot of the necessities and needs and, and forces of oppression. I was lucky enough to be at a workshop with Sylvia Federici in the summer, you mentioned. And, so, and she said, she said, this has to work in both directions because even the Zapatistas have to sell coffee. 
So we can't forget those relationships and where the weaknesses are, where, where we have our strength in organising and, and disruption. And that is a class-based relationship that you can't ignore. Sorry. Let's <laughs> come across. Um, yeah, short Short question. Uh, I guess it's along the same vein. I, I, I understand the sentiment of the last gentleman who just talked that, you know, during the summer uprising in Bristol, we had a, had a very, very similar um, experience uh, of kind of elation at, at that kind of organisation. It felt like something very new. Um, and then the, the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, grief afterwards. Um, and uh, I, I've struggled to rationalise that, but I think I've rationalised it as... Uh, as a kind of cognitive dissonance in that, um, uh, you know, that, that kind of organisation, that kind of system which is created for that short period of time can only ever be and is a superimposition on top of what is a, an entrenched system. And, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are in an emergency here, that's what I really wanted to say, you know, and, and you know, it's great to theorise and, and have lots of ideas, but... Um, we are in a desperate, desperate emergency here, and we're run, we're out of time. And I just, I really want to know, you know, how we break through these underlying barriers of land ownership and property ownership, which which are feeding many of these systemic issues. You know, and, and common in communities, they can only exist as as a periphery to this system without challenging that that full system. And so, I I, I really appreciate your talk, and I, and and it seems like your book is a fantastic. Um, exploration of, of, of uh, how to live in the commons almost, uh, but it still feels like an unreachable goal. I would just say quickly, it's not an either or proposition. The agency themselves is accessible to the people who are in that demonstration, importantly with a different logic that they, they were, you could, agency can occur anywhere from that bottom up, and it was precisely that they were asserting a different logic which has the capacity for, for creating something new. So I don't think we should get pre prejudicial about where this agency is going to come from or how it's going to assert the logic culturally, which I think will precede the political manifestations. So that's, I, I don't, you, we might disagree on that, but that's how I interpret some of these stories. And, and I might add, this is not a theoretical imposition. These things are happening all over without necessarily being named or theorized. I'm simply trying to, quote, theorize in an organic way from empirical examples to say this is happening. It's just not being culturally recognized. Anyone quickly on the panel want to respond to that question? Well, maybe, sorry. Right. Yeah, okay. um, yeah, temporary autonomous zones. I, th I mean, I think... One of the things I'd say is they probably have a, an intrinsic value that's, which is really powerful, important, and you can look back at, um, um, I was thinking again, we uh, had some speakers who were involved with the occupation of Bristol University in 1968, and that experience, it lasted for 11 days, they were kind of defeated, or they made some gains, um, but actually that experience of, of living in a different reality and uh, experiencing um, participatory democracy um, it was a massively, massively powerful experience for them. And I would say probably people who'd been through experiences like the miners' strike, um, that, that kind of working class solidarity was very, very powerful. And then that's, uh, although certain lim limits to uh, temporary autonomous zones. Um, I, I suppose linked to that, I was at another discussion um, probably about 10 days ago, and there was a huge discussion about this issue about individual change and collective change and is, you know is individual change pointless tokenistic it needs to be collective and I really like um, actually there's a there's a phrase in your book David cultivate shared intentionality and I think that's a really nice way of breaking down that that kind of uh, opposition between the two things and I suppose I've got some criticisms of groups like um, extinction rebellion but I think they what they have done very well is they they have managed to diversify the ecology movement and, and really like I've, I've got some friends up in Nottingham and there's a Muslim group and there's a Buddhist group and there's all these different groups going on. I don't remember the green movement really being like that in the past. It was kind of quite narrow um, in, in many ways and it, it does feel like there's been an achievement there. 
And um, so in terms of class politics, maybe that, that, that is a step forward. But um, you know, I can't offer you lots of hope and optimism, but I think there's some, I think things are very fluid at the moment. I think there's a lot of changes and I think maybe we're learning from, you know, maybe, maybe the Occupy movement learned from the, uh, the movements of, I mean, I was involved with the direct action movements of the, uh, of the, of the road protests in the, in the 80s and 90s and, and, and reclaim the streets and things like that. Maybe Occupy um, managed to work across borders and, and uh, was quite powerful on that level. And maybe Extinction Rebellion is, is learning a few more things along the way. So uh, may, maybe, the, the, maybe there is this um, accumulative um, increase in um, sophistication, I suppose, in, in, in the opposition to um, in, in closure and um, um, the things that we're trying to talk about and achieve today. Nice one, very quick. Yeah, well, I was just going to maybe repose the question. It might satisfy um, some this demand for class analysis and class conflict, maybe. Is of, um, rather than seeing commoning as something peripheral and external to capitalism, maybe we could think about how we unenclose things that are already uh, currently enclosed and how we help people who um, don't have spare time, and don't have a lot of resources, how they can confront their immediate, immediate um, situation and try to take things back under control again. Uh, did you want to... I'm just really interested. Um, sorry. Um, I, I wonder about the role also of power and privilege. We're quite a privileged audience here in global terms. Um, and what is our role in other people's experience of enclosure? I'm just wondering how much time we spend reflecting too on... We are quite powerful in, in the way that we make decisions every day. We make decisions that affect people all over the world. And I, I hear... The gentleman in the blue shirt, I don't know your name, sorry. Your, your, your frustrations, it's visceral, it's palpable, but what do you think stopping you? Private property ownership and land ownership. It, it, seems, to be an, uh, it seems to be an almost impenetrable barrier. You know, I mean, whatever you want to do in this world, you come up against those barriers. You know, and and I, I don't see how you make real change in how you... I mean, because, you know, the, the commons in terms of Wikipedia and these other systems which, and, and open source software, you know, great examples of, of commons, but, but they're ultimately without uh, land and without property. You know, they exist in virtual space. And, and, but ultimately, we're, we're, we're animals, we're human beings, you know, we require food and we require shelter. And, and so everything comes back to land and, and to food. And, 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 and whilst our world is owned and controlled by... Uh, a, 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 a class of uh, ownership which is backed up by state lawfulness um, it seems impenetrable I just you know I just don't yeah I am exacerbated I'm frustrated uh, and, and um, <coughs> it, it, it seems the gradual gradual approach I'm looking for an alternative to, to violent revolution basically because I'm definitely not a violent revolutionary but I can understand why Marx came to that conclusion you know because yeah there's a great book by a woman called Erica Chenoweth who looked at this Does anyone... and she she did an analysis of the last 150 200 years of um, bloody revolution and non-violent resistance and non-violent resistance wins successful. yeah exactly <laughs> and she reckons on average, three and a half percent of the population engaged will make massive change happen. Um, I don't know what three and a half percent of the population of Bristol is. It's not very many people. So, uh, I'll start by introducing myself because if we're commoning, we should do that. So, my name's Angela. I'm involved in transition stuff and food and farming movement. I just wanted to bring in. There has been a huge change in the last 50 years from scientific research into human psychology. So the modular model of, of the mind, you know, there is no chief executive in charge. The mode we are, enact is very dependent on our surroundings. So all of us could be murderous if we needed to be. All of us can be incredibly compassionate. But all of us are born with an app in our head which has this tendency to other, to see people as enemies. And the moment we see people with enemy eyes, the way we interpret everything that happens 
is different if we see people as friends. And just the simple fact that we now understand that, it's like suddenly playing a computer game and realising actually you don't have to play by those rules. And I just throw that into the mix and that's, that has informed all the rules that XR has from the start. In the beginning of transition we didn't have those. We had terrible conflicts in groups. Um, and the groups that managed to deal with that in a really constructive way survived, and the ones that didn't, didn't. Um, so that insight into our own beings is tremendously powerful. I think I'll take three when we go to questions that people will respond. Um, I was just interested in something you said about how we had the commons and then we had the kind of 200 years of the individual, or, or the kind of philosophy of that. And I find it interesting that that's come about as a reaction to like population growth. And then I was having a conversation earlier with someone about who told me that in Indonesia, premarital sex has just been outlawed and it is linked to um, Saudi Arabia investing in a kind of <coughs> radicalism of the Islam that is, you know, widespread across Indonesian culture. Um, and I was thinking about, is populism always going to be a threat in a world full of so many people? And how do we move away from this kind of polarised world where we have, like... So, so the reaction to populism is naturally to go, like, me included, very much, no, we cannot have this, this is unacceptable, we cannot have this, let's develop things like XR, let's be part of it, that's brilliant. How do we... How do we stop it moving further away? How do we bring it together? Because previously, in a world of commons, it wasn't as densely populated. And, and like, how do we get to a place where people don't feel so um, like overwhelmed by the presence of, of, of everyone else, either physically or mentally or whatever? I'm just kind of worried about how to do that myself. Hmm. Yeah, you mentioned during the initial presentation the importance of language in reframing the discussion. I'm curious, therefore, why the word insurgent was dropped from the German edition of the book. Mm. Um, I, don't, I can't speak to that. Well, we'll, we'll, I'll talk. Do we take more questions? or? Um, I think. Is there anyone else? Yes, yeah, take one more and then we okay. can respond to... Yeah, this is a bit of a, of, of a weird one to frame, um, and it's talking about the next 10 to 20 years. Um, so, so really early on in, in when Dave was talking, I was, something popped into my head, which was um, that in, in, at the moment we're going through, we're approaching a kind of second industrial revolution with automation, machine learning, and all that kind of stuff, which potentially, that 3% number was quite interesting. I haven't, I haven't seen any of the numbers of how many people it affect, but you're talking about whereas the first industrial revolution effect whatever you want to call them, the working class or people who are earning less, the second industrial revolution is, in fact, kind of, is likely to infect, infect, <laughs> affect large amounts of middle, middle earners. And the ways around this are people are talking about universal basic income, which would be something which would free a lot of people up to kind of engage in common and stuff like that. And short of a, a kind of massive population decrease, if there really are you know, that many jobs that are going to go to this. Although, in the context of what happened in the first Industrial Revolution, I'm not sure. So how do you think that fits into what is likely to be potentially, possibly a quite positive outcome in terms of commons and people engaging more in communities? Sorry, it's a bit of a long one, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure that... What, do you have a precise question for me? Well, I'm saying that if you, if you suddenly make huge amounts of people, quite large people unemployed, and find a way that they don't actually have to work, which is what one of the solutions to the second industrial revolution is. How do you think, you know, I mean, I, I, the, the obvious is quite, the, the answer is quite obvious, but I'd like to hear your feelings on how this would affect commoning. Okay. Well, let me try to answer some of the last three or four questions. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just do yours because the last one. Um, I think that commoning by taking people's dependency off, out of markets to the extent possible helps, uh, first of all, I think it creates more of a culture of sufficiency, which we very much need in a world of overconsumption, and uh, can help also insulate us more from the kind of predations that we've come to expect, at least from transnational capital-driven markets. 
So to that extent, can become a stabilizing force, which is all not to say, I'd like to stress, these are not either or to a lot of more conventional approaches like universal basic income. Uh, but I think uh, to the extent that we can create these uh, diversified alternative <coughs> ways of governing and provisioning, it's uh, creating resilience. And I might then pick up these other two questions. I think the commons helps fill a lot of voids and meaning that are difficult in today's contemporary culture. One reason nationalism has surged to the fore is because there's a void of ways to create meaning and community. And I don't think the left has a significant answer to that uh, that's more than economic. I mean, I'm overstating, but... And so to the extent that a commons can become a vehicle for meaning making that's uh, local and contextualized, and not a more authoritarian response, I think that's a positive, res positive response that should be encouraged in many respects. As for the word insurgent not being in the German title, I, I wasn't part of that, but I seem to recall that that was seen as a more uh, harder word in German, the translation word, than, I don't know if you know, I, I'm not, I don't speak German, but was seen as a more uh, harsher word mm. than intended in the English. But uh, to, to, be, to be honest, you'd have to ask the publisher or my co-author. Um, was there anything else raised? Um, no, remind me. But those are, those are yeah. some of my responses to what was raised. I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards. Melissa, do you have any responses to uh, Not particularly, no. <laughs> <laughs> Lots to say, if that's all right. <laughs> um, I'm just going to say two of the three things I want to say. Um, the first one's around automation. And again, you have to bring back the question of how is society organized and production things for whom and how. So automation will be great as long as we resolve any capital labor relations under capitalism. Right? Because as long as capital can profit out of employing people and exploiting them, it will and it will play on joblessness in order to do so. So let me give an example that I steal from a socialist environmental activist called Elaine Graham Lee. She said, and she's about my age, she said, you know, there was a time when you were a kid and the, every garage had a automated car wash, right? We used to be so, I used to be so excited about the prospect of going through an automated car wash. Today, hand car washes based on very low wages prevail, right? There are many more, like Eastern Europeans and uh, Middle Eastern people um, washing our cars and there are automation. You know, as long as capital can profit from cheap labor and ma making sure a lot of people are jobless, it will. That, that's the truth, you have to transcend that. And then the question of violence, right? I'm not advocating violence here, but I wanna say that look at history and have a look at what movements we're trying to achieve. Right? You don't achieve anything that's break, uh, breakdown of capitalism or transcending capitalism without violence. And the reason for that, that's not on the part of the movements, that's on the part of the state apparatus in response to that. In Hong Kong at the moment, a quarter of the citizens are marching every weekend and they've been doing that since June. Right? The response, it hasn't been violent mobs on the part, you know, the, it's been the repression of the state exercising itself in violence. So I, I actually can't see something really transformatory being non-violent because there are a section of society out there who are able to protect their property and their advantage by deploying violent means of the state. So I don't know, anyway. So I think you do, you do have to reappropriate. This is another from Silvia Federici. We have to reappropriate everything. And at some point, and, and the capitalists will resist that. <laughs> I would just say that adding, creating alternatives that are functional that work even on small scales and thereby withdrawing from dependence on the market and protecting them the way, I know it's a cliche, but open source software is a way of creating autonomy and control that itself is very threatening to capital because it's uh, withdrawing from their circuits of value creation. And I think that's what the commons does and that's why it's a nonviolent approach for uh, helping to starve the bees uh, incrementally. So we should have two more questions and then we can wind up. Is there, if there is two more. Oh, yeah. Okay, I want to introduce some mess into this. 
Um, um, because uh, thinking about commons of place, there's um, that the have to allow for heterogeneity to the point of mutually exclusive truths. Um, the commons that you seem to be talking about seem to be about um, common aims, common identities, which which isn't the same thing actually as a commons of place, which contains um, difference. David, thank you for your talk. I thought it was really great. Can I, I just want to push you on your kind of like chapter 18 to 23 thing, um, which I thought was a lovely analysis. You know, so many people have a great kind of like, this is the problem, but what's the solution? One of the things you kind of hit upon was the notion that the commons in many different ways have been enclosed. So land has been enclosed, genes have been enclosed, seeds have been enclosed. And a few other people have kind of hit upon this in their questions, and I just want to kind of like get your thoughts on it. How do we unenclose yeah. what was once common? So I love the idea of Wikipedia and open source software and those things, but how do we unenclose the, the commons which we've now lost? I, I just value your thoughts on that. Can you skip one more? Can you press in here? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I was wondering, um, with this new world view, kind of with the, like a new language and that, what, um, and the side of agency, which you kind of talked about, what kind of new skill sets, personal ones, do you think we need to start learning um, in order to take part in more than temporary um, commons? Because I think it's, you know, the whole idea of how groups form, storming, forming, norming, etc. I think it's very much easier to do it short term, but as a long term thing, what kind of personal skill sets, new ones, do you think we need to, we need to grapple with then? <coughs> That's a great question, and that's precisely what our patterns of comedy are seeking to address by naming specific patterns without being overly prescriptive uh, at an interpersonal social level for sustaining it. Now, that's not to say that larger structure, institutional structures or infrastructures may not be needed, but those are the human behaviors that we need to cultivate for commoning the verb as opposed to commons, the unowned resource. Um, that's obviously a longer conversation. As far as um, how we unenclose, uh, it, there's fascinating uh, initiatives like the Open Source Seed Initiative, which is devising licenses, or in another instance, they, for a lot of reasons, they think licenses are inappropriate or cumbersome, so they're trying to develop a pledge system and shame anybody who uh, violates the pledge to develop a whole set of basically shareable seeds instead of those that are patented and locked up. They're modest early initiatives, but it's precisely the uh, defensible, legally defensible attempts to uh, unenclose. And there are a lot of vehicle, I mean, this is not just open source and Wikipedia. There's community land trusts that are a way for starting to re or unenclose land. George Monbiot, who's a friend of the, the uh, commons, wrote a recent major report that was quite comprehensive of different ways to unenclose land in the UK, which I think is a fantastic uh, guidebook or roadmap to how we can do this. And the point of a lot of this is to have I think having the commons framing and language helps us give a sovereign vision that doesn't get wrapped up in party politics or state necessarily, even though of course you have to engage with them, but gives a perspective, sovereign perspective as a human right and uh, a necessity for human flourishing to pursue these things without, uh, from the get-go, making it a, uh, a political situation because that gives, uh, frees it from being this ideological, totalistic argument. It becomes something deeper about uh, the kind of feelings that the first gentleman <coughs> spoke about. Um, so those are some of my concerns for that. But I would add, this is a creative process in, in fighting back against enclosures. And some of the more successful ones were, I think, brilliant, actions of mobilizing a group of people who depended on the resource and having creative lawyers devise new schemes. So that's, I think, a different front, but I think it's a more defensible front 
than many, say, regulatory ones where the next administration gets in and it's vulnerable and wiped out. So that's why I like to think in terms of some of these solutions, they have greater durability. In terms of back there, I think pluralism and pluralistic perspectives is at the heart of the commons because every context will be different. And that we, this is a way of honoring that and getting out of the othering impulse, which is so prevalent. And to the extent that we can start to recognize multiple identities and world-making um, quests as legitimate, uh, and part of the commons um, ethic as a human, we start to uh, open up this space and normalize it instead of reverting to crude otherism. Can I just, um, I think um, your question was really interesting too. Um, in terms of behaviors, um, the values, the intrinsic values, uh, the, the way that the Common Cause Foundation would talk about it would, would say, okay, show your values show them very clearly, assume others share your values, and then facilitate conversations about what you care about. And given that I think it's taken me a ridiculously long time to come to this um, understanding, but the only thing I really can have much agency over is my own behaviours. And I think it's really worth reflecting that all of our identities are co-created in relationship with others. We are always in relationship with others. And it's those small co-creations that happen all the time in our everyday lives where we can show, assume and facilitate, where we can make quite profound things happen. Now, I agree, I agree that's not a massive scale, but when are we ever going to have the agency to make massive stuff happen? We, we really can start quite assiduously with ourselves. Okay, on that note, <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, David and all the panel. For, um,